Are you ready for the word? You are ready for the word? You know I'm going to say I'm ready for the word. I'm ready for change. Hallelujah. Hebu tuende sasa katika maandiko and we going back to the book of First Samuel. Book of First Samuel chapter number 30. Remember, we continuing with our teachings on training for kingdom rulership. What is in view, what is in perspective is a rulership in a kingdom that we are working on. And our example has been the King David. So let's go to the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 30. And this is the second part of restoration after destruction. You remember last Sunday we ended... Um, the second part, of course, this is part 20, part 20 in our series of training for kingdom rulership, but we are handling a subtopic on restoration after destruction. This is a man that had backslidden and his life completely destroyed by destruction. Come at while I'm about to make a Bible study, we have learned all these things these calamities that had befallen David because of going away and getting, uh, you know, getting himself out of the presence of God, the pain and the price tag that he's got to pay for his backsliding. And we have all come to realize when you backslide, when you take a deliberate step to engage with the enemy and slowly drift away, the pain is unbearable. So you'd rather stay in God's presence. In chapter number 29, we were able to cruise through and saw that destruction in the life of David. But in chapter number 29, we begin to see David moving on with a broken heart towards going back to the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And therefore, in chapter number 30, verse number 1, which we covered last Sunday, we discovered that David, upon seeing that the city of Ziglag was now in flames and the enemies had destroyed everything that he had had and completely lost everything in the hands of the enemy. That moved David's heart to begin repenting and turning his heart to God. And we have say you don't have to wait until that moment of destruction because when you lose everything that is not the time to go back to the lord i know it has been said every so often when you have come to the end of yourself that is when god begins it is true but my submissions today is that you really don't have to wait until you are finished so that you can go back to god because there will be an assessment test that in that point of destruction whether you've been working with god and as we compare the two leaders, David and Saul, at the point of destruction, Saul was not working with God. His heart was not repentant, but David was repentant. And it's because of his repentant heart that God started to bring him restoration. Last Sunday, David inquired from God because of the displacement after that which he had uh, treasured so much as the treasures in his backslidden state. We found number one, David found himself in displacement after rejection. And number two, we discover that David found himself guilty and completely confused because of the state that he was in. And number three, David now starts to think of what he can do to revenge upon those who have, who have destroyed Ziglag is city, but this could not work. He knew that the Amalekites had decided to burn his city and to burn everything because of what he had did. This was a revenge mission by the Amalekites. And then number four, we discover that David realizes that it's only in the presence of God that he can be able to completely find restoration. And that is important for us to realize when everything has come to a standstill in our lives, our hope can only be found in God. When Saul had come to the end of himself, he decided to consult with witches. 
aliamua kwenda kwa wachawi kwa wapiga ramli na kwa wale ambao wanao mia madaa ili aweze kupanda kujua mambo yake yako namna gani only to realize that did not work let me tell you going to the witches and going to those who practice occultism and such will not be the solution to your destruction the solution to our destruction is by turning our faces back to god praise the name of the lord when we turn to god and we cry to god our god is a merciful god he will hear our cry bana asifiwe san so this is a man because of his problems his men number 5 begin to blame him for their loss and people that he has worked with people that have been his friends people that he has helped they all turn against him i've come to realize when god is dealing with a man god will allow certain things to happen in your life even your very close friends to run away from you and when they run away from you and they begin to blame you that is a time that god is calling you you remember joseph in the time joseph had gone to his brothers to just get to know about their wealth but they turned against him they said let's put him in the pit let's kill him he helped them he had brought food he had come to nourish them but those whom he had come to help they turned against him look at jesus the people that he came to save they turned against him and they shouted crucify him crucify him they ended up putting him on the cross and this is david with his very man that he helped them you remember when they came to him everyone was discouraged everybody was dis- disappointed everyone was in debt but now because of his simple mistakes this man have decided to stone him to kill him because of what he found himself in and at that point it is only god and therefore number 6 david turned to god in repentance he turned to god may you turn to god at the very point of your affliction may you turn to him because he will not disappoint you can somebody say amen and then number 7 we discovered he brings in the priest and inquired of the lord praise the name of the lord he talks to the only priest that had remained that is abitha because the rest of the other priests 85 of them had been killed by Saul and therefore he brings abitha and abitha takes the hefford with the horn and the thumin of god and the eight stones that we have discovered in bible study and as abitha was standing in the presence of god on behalf of david david inquired from god and god heard his cry hallelujah when time came to inquire from god saul did not have a priest he didn't have a man of god in his life and therefore he went by his own and i've told you each one of us must have a pastor must have a man of god in your life when as if you a son we must have a church we must have a sense of belonging we must have one whom we can turn to a person that teaches us the word or feeds us with knowledge and understanding according to jeremiah 3:15 i will give you pastors to feed you with knowledge and understanding your pastor your priest in life is one of the most important assets in your life never mistreat that which god uses to speak to your life one as if you are son saul had eliminated all of them and when the time of need came he had nobody but david had protected habitha and the time of need david turned to habitha and he told habitha priest of god can you bring the effort and therefore habitha brings the effort and the bible says david inquired from god besides it was the priest of god and when god heard from david david asked him the lord can i pursue the enemy and god told him yes pursue the enemy and recover everything david pursued the enemy and recovered everything and we must put all these pieces together to see how that whole story comes up you have heard it been preached but most of it has been preached out of context it's not just waking up and rising up to recover everything that is not the point the point is that which precipitated towards 
What was happening? What kind of condition did David find himself in? Now I want us to connect so that we can finish this whole part, number two, part 20. Let's connect with next verses and see what is happening after David has been granted the permission by the Lord to move forward. Now I would like you to realize something. Now a fresh engagement with God begins with David. One has few son. This is a man that has been backslidden. This is a man that has not been working with God. And when he pleaded with God, when he turned to God, God had his prayer. Listen to me. The Bible says that God will regard the prayer of the destitute. Did you hear what I said? God will listen to the prayer of the destitute. And then he also says in Psalms 51, a contrite heart and a broken spirit God will not despise. When we come to God in humility, and as what James 1.21 tells us, that we put aside our filthness and overflow of wickedness so that we can receive with meekness. When we come to God in such a condition, God will regard our prayer. And as the scripture says, David had completely fallen. He was no longer working with God. He didn't have a sense of God's presence. He didn't have anything. But now, he has cried to God. And God has uh, heard his cry. And God is willing to impress him. The thing that we find here in verses number 8, as he inquired from God, and God tells him to recover all, God did not tell David, I'm going to put you in a probation for six months. I'm going to put you aside to see whether you have totally reformed for a period of one year. To really assess you and see if you are really completely restored. And that tells us how faithful our God is. Look at you and tell them God is so faithful. Because he doesn't look from the outside. Man looks from the outside, but God looks from what? Amen. God looks at your heart. But when people look at us, they judge us by our failures. They judge us by what we have not been able to do. They judge us by our misfortunes. They judge us by our backgrounds. They judge us by our everything. But our God cannot judge you in that manner. Praise the name of the Lord. God forgave David. And he looked at him as if it were a man that had not sinned before. <laughs> That's what happens when God forgives us. When God forgives us, he forgives and forgets. And he is willing to use us yet again. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. God will use you again. Let me tell you something. Seated before me are mighty men and women of God. When I look at you, I'm not looking at you at the point of failure. I'm looking at you on what you can become in God's hand. The Bible tells us that in a rich man's house are many vessels, very many vessels. Some of honor and some of dishonor. But if a man cleanses himself from the late, God, he picks him up, cleanses him, and that person becomes a vessel of honor. Ask your neighbor, neighbor. Just this is a polite inquiry from your neighbor. Ask him, neighbor, can you be sincere to me? What do you think about God and your life? Does he think about you as a lost thing, useless thing? That's not how God thinks. But people out there in your estate, in your place of work, they look at you as a rejected object. They don't see anything of value because of your failure. Maybe you have aborted five times. You have changed women. You have changed men. Ask your neighbor, what kind of a man are you? How many times have you failed? God collected David. I can collect from the dustbin of sin, from his dustbin of his rejection. When everybody had abandoned him, God collected him, and God forgave him, and God cleansed him, and God started to use him. Praise the name of the Lord. He asked him, can I pursue the Amalekites who have destroyed my life? Can I... God told him, rise up quickly and pursue them and recover everything. Hallelujah. 
when a backslider, when a man that had drifted away wakes up again and corrects their ways with God, God can use them to do exploits. Verse number 9. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Benso, where those left behind remained. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 who were with them were very exhausted to cross the brook Benso, remained behind. With 600 men, some of them cannot pursue. They get tired and remain in Benso. These other 400 are still disgruntled, you know, because of the bitterness and the shame and the whatever. And, but they, you know, just decide to follow David. And they, you know, they go with him. But David had the word of the Lord. When you have the word of the Lord, it doesn't matter how much opposition is on your side. It doesn't matter how much failure that you have been in. Let me tell you. It is God's word that gives us impetus to move forward. If you have the revealed word of God, this word revives you. You know why people wake up in the morning to pray and call on God? Because they have the word of God in their hearts. You know why people go to church early in the morning? They go because they have the word of God stirring them up. Some of them may feel weak and tired to remain. Some of them will feel that coming to church early at 7.30 to pray is a big task. But you can remain behind. We will go ahead and pray. Praise the name of the Lord. Why? Because we have a stirring up in our hearts. We have the word of the Lord in our hearts. Can somebody say amen? Look at this. There were 600. And men of this, 200 of them, they feel no. Hapana. Hallelujah. David had no problem. But Kufuatilia. Praise the name of Jesus. You know, it is the word of God. The Bible says in him we live. In him we move. And in him we have all our being. Praise the name of Jesus. And because David knew that in this second chance, God is with me. I will trust in his faithfulness. I will trust in his goodness. I will trust in his mercy. Bible says his mercies are new every morning. David forgot about his past failures. He forgot about his past mistakes. And decided to pattern his life in accordance with the revealed word of God. Because God said, come on, David pursue and recover it all. David did not have to remember of the past mistakes. He did not have to remember of the past failures. He did not have to remember of that which was negative and evil that he had done. He moved with the word of the Lord. Let me tell you, it is the word of God that will give you space. It is the word of God that will give you breakthroughs. It is the word of God that will keep you going. You may have made mistakes before. But that's not our license to failure. It doesn't mean, mean that you will remain in failure. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. When God brings people to Jesus Christ, some of them wake up with a lot of power and vitality. They, began, they begin to overshadow everybody in the church. They are serving so quickly and vigorous. They are waking up. They are there. In the, some of us who are so carnal, have you seen people like that, full of the devil, full of wickedness? They slow down others that are fired up by the Holy Spirit. Do you have to wake up to that time to go to church? Do you have what to do? You don't have to be a fanatic in God. Now, that is the sound of a backslidden person that is not willing to rise up and pick up. Pick up his burdens and move forward. I've seen many Christians discourage Christians. Yeah? New Christians, new believers, they disappoint them. They put barriers for them to move forward in the Lord. And because of putting those barriers in the Lord, they themselves are not moving forward. Neither are they draw. They are just stagnant. They want to have a company of failures around them. You need to see this picture of David and the 600 men. When the two ones, they say they cannot continue, he told them, just be left behind in vessel. And then we will move with the 400 that are willing. Never stop the work of God. Never pull down God's people when the Lord is pushing them forward. If you want to drift away, drift alone. 
Don't put a stumbling block to your family. Let them move forward with God. Hallelujah. And because David was assured that the Lord is working with him, he was willing to go all the distance. Couple of things. One, David discovered God's faithfulness. That's the first thing. That is what gave him the impetus of moving forward to recover everything. He discovered God's faithfulness. The scripture says, if we are faithless, he himself is faithful. He cannot deny himself. Praise the name of the Lord. He cannot. Second point. We find, then David begins to fight the Amalekites. The fighting of the Amalekites as he moves forward. Let's read verse number we begin to read from verse number 11. Now, they found an Egyptian in the field as they were going to pursue the Amalekites in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate. And they provided him water and drink. In scripture, bread is a type of the word. So they give this man bread to eat and provided him with water to drink. Of course, water, again, plays two roles, the word of God and the spirit of the Lord at the same time. Verse number 12, of B. For he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. The significance of a person that has not heard anything from God for a whole complete period of time. And therefore, they give him the word and nourish him in the spirit. David said to him, to whom do you belong? And where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. Remember, this young man was not an Amalekite, but he was a servant. I was an Egyptian and a Malachite. And you remember the history of the Egyptians and the Amalekites. Amen. Egyptians represent a type of the world. A type of the world, a people of the world. Where were the children of Israel? They were moved from Egypt from the type of the world. And what does this man find when he comes to David and his men? He finds bread and water. Though he's been a man of the world, he is nourished with the bread of life and water. He is born again. But that's not enough. He was serving an Amalekite. I want you to take care of that because these are important words that are going to be of his significance as we continue studying scripture. So they ask him, David, ask him, to whom do you belong? What is your identity? It's a question of an identity. And where are you from? He said, I'm a young man from Egypt, a servant of a Malachite. And my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. Who is the master of the young man? A Malachite. Who are Malachites? They are enemies of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's move on. Verse number 14. We made a raid on the Negev of the Kerisites. And on that which belongs to Judah. And of the Negev of Caleb. And we burned Ziglag with fire. That an enemy of God, that is the Egyptians coupled with the enemies of God are the ones that look to have destroyed that which belongs to God's people in Judah, in Negev, and in Zeglag. They're the ones who are used to ban the enemies of God. Verse number 15, then David said to him, will you bring me down to this band? And they said, so to me, by God, that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master. And I will bring you down to this hand. When he had brought him down, behold, they were spread over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. I want you to follow me very carefully because what comes out here is a son of an Egyptian that has eaten bread and have drunk from the cup of David and his men. 
Remember David, in some places in scripture, he plays out as a type of Jesus Christ. And then these 600 men and 400, they are a type of Christians. And that's why you find among the 600, which number six is at the number of men, 400 of them decide to move forward, but 200 are tired, they cannot be able to move forward. That's significant to the story of the 10 virgins. All of them were waiting for the coming of the bridegroom, but some of them got tired. They could not keep alive their lambs. And by not keeping their, lamb, their, their lambs alive, they got tired. And when the bridegroom came, he did not find them ready. Now, let's move on. Here, though these young men, servant of the Amalekite, or the once was an Egyptian, has eaten bread and drink, he has partnered with the enemies of the Israelites, that is the Amalekites, and they have burned up David's city, that is the city of Ziglag. But remember, in this particular position, he has eaten and drunk from David, significance of a man that has now been changed, though he's been an Egyptian, though he's been in the world, and David is going with him. And that's where there is a swearing here. He's telling David, David, please swear that you will not eliminate me, you will not kill my life. And David tells him, I will not kill you. I will not dare do anything like that. Please go with me. And they go together. And as they go together, they are able to get the enemies and their spoils. The young man leads them to where the Amalekites were. And therefore, what does David do? They were able to fight out the Amalekites. And this leads us to number three. The significance of the Amalekites that are in view here. That have been to be fought. Those people or those guys have to be fought. The first time we find the story of the Amalekites is in Numbers chapter number 24, verse number 20. When the Bible says, And he looked at Amalek and took up his discourse and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his end shall be destruction. The first time that is mentioned in scripture, God says the end of Amalek will be destruction. Amen. And this is good for us to realize this, that when the word of God means or says what it says, it means what it says. In other words, it's destruction. It means he will be blotted out. He will be destroyed. Let's go further and see something else in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 25, verse number 19. Moses' instruction to the second generation of Israel. The Bible says in verse number 19, Therefore it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land, which the Lord God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven you must not forget. So God, from the beginning, because of what the Amalekites did, he had rendered them as his enemy. And God had told Israel, just as he had told them not to allow witches and mediums in the land, to ensure that forever they will deal with Amalekites. Are we together, the men? They will deal with Amalekites. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter number 15, we see God's instruction to King Saul. I want to teach you some scripture here and see why David had to go back and deal with his Amalekites. Verse number 3 of 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Now, go and strike the Amalekites and utterly destroy all that what he has and do not spare him. Put him to death, both man and woman, child and infant, or ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So when Saul came into rulership, God's instruction was deal with Amalek, finish him. Because God follows his word to perform it. From the beginning he said the, end of the Amalekites should not be allowed to live in the land. And therefore they should always be put to death. They shall be utterly destroyed. Did Saul deal with Amalekites? Did Saul finish the Amalekites? No, he did not. And that's where his train walking with God began. Are we together, Watu Amungu? 
That's where his trend began because he did not deal with the Amalekite. But then he continued. Now, this brings out a clear picture. Saul, a saved Christian, a man of God, called by God. And God did, tells him to deal with the Amalekite. But Saul does not deal with the Amalekite. He continues entertaining and allowing them. In the life of a Christian, Amalek has to do with that which is of the flesh. That fights our walk in the spirit. That which fights our walk in the spirit. The enemy of God. Hallelujah. To the one of in the enemy of God, God says, cut off that enemy in your life. The Bible says in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh in regard to lust. So as we move on with our life in Christ, if we're going to recover everything, because David is on his mission to recover everything that the enemy had stolen in his life. And his priority is to finish the Amalekites. Are we together? To finish the Amalekites so that he can recover everything. So the first thing in our restoration, once a man has received a restoration, has been forgiven of the Lord to come out of backsliding and move forward, he must be willing to deal with the Amalekites. Somebody say Amalekites. We must deal with the desires of the flesh, that which is of the flesh, that which brings in diversions into fulfilling God's will in our lives. The scripture says we should make no provision for the flesh. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. We should not make any allowance of the flesh in our lives. Amalekite are a type of the enemies of God. Egyptians is a type of the world. And there are three enemies. Write this down. There are three enemies that each one of us has as a Christian. The first one is the world. Where we came from before we got saved. And this is where we find this Egyptian coming from. Are you with me? I'm teaching you the scriptures. The first enemy is who? The world. Are we together? And the second enemy is the flesh. The Amalekites. And the third enemy is the devil. Those are the three biggest enemies of man. As he moves to fulfill what God has called him to be. You will always be challenged by what the world is doing. The world will be pulling you to pattern and do everything it offers. And your flesh will always want you to do that which is not in accordance with the will of God. That which is pleasing to the eye. When God told someone, go and finish the Amalekites and kill everybody. Don't spare anything, both men and women, even everything. David, I mean, Saul went and said no. These guys are very fat cows. These ones are very good. And I think probably was a businessman. A businessman. <laughs> he was not willing to lose. And many business people, they don't want to lose. They want to get any losses. But the Bible says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Yeah? And then the Bible also says that a man's life does not consist of all the things, of all the accumulations that he has. Here is a 400 million building. And we are seated here by a massive building. But that person having that big building does not mean that he is near to God because he has a lot of money than we do. A man's life does not consist of the things that he owns. You may have come to the church walking. I may have come to church driving. Or you may have come cycling or in a motorbike. Or you may have borrowed a leaf to come in here. However you can, your life does not consist of what you don't have or what you have. Tunawana parajamen. All of us, mbele za mungu, tuko sambamba. Mwambi jirani yako wewe na mimi ni sambamba mbele za buwana. So this guy, Anashindwa na could deal with the Amalekites who are flesh. And therefore he became an enemy of God. 
And he ended up being an enemy of God because he was not able to deal with the Amalekites. And therefore, wakati ambapo David is restored, he realizes that these Amalekites, the ones who have destroyed his life, and destroyed everything, they are God's enemies. And all what I have got to do is to make a concerted effort to ensure that I stop Amalekites from my life. Today there is a call that you and me have to deal with the Amalekites of our life. Tell your neighbor, you must deal with the Amalekite of your life. Hallelujah. And therefore this is really very important for us to realize. Let me give you a couple of scriptures so that this can, we can move forward. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 7, 18 to 25, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells nothing good, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would want I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is not more that I do, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, marrying against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man, what I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The body of this flesh. I thank God through Jesus Christ. That's verse number 25, our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the Lord God. But with the flesh, the Lord to sin. This is, a Paul, this is Paul, a great man. He discovered, ya kwamba, katika maisha ambao nao, there is nothing good that serving the flesh, ama kutumikia wala wa malakaid, in a letter. You know, being a servant of the flesh, hmm? being directed and that which is pleasing to the eye. Let me say this as I explain a little bit about the fleshly things. The fleshly thing is that which our eyes last for. Kile ambacho macho yetu yanataka kupata. That which we are attracted to. That which we want to get. So that when we have it, we will feel good within our flesh. When you have money, a lot of money, you feel good with your flesh. When you have sexual issues, you, it's like you satisfy the flesh. And a lot of people are fighting to have the best girl in town, to associate themselves with the best young man in town. They are fighting to get the best car, to get the best house, so that they can make the flesh feel good. I want you to know that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the eye, the Bible says they are not of God. One as if we are son. But Paul tells us yeah, how we deal with that which comes into our minds. I want you to know, and from this day, you need to be careful of the people in the church that are walking in the flesh. Are we together? So that they don't influence you. If somebody cannot settle in a service, they cannot sit down. And listen to the word of God. Their mind is distorted. They are every now and then they are moving. And they are doing this thing. Sometimes we may look spiritual by the way we dress. But that does not necessarily mean that we are dealing with the Amalekites. Are you with me? That is something you need to stop from today. So that you don't appear spiritual before people. And when people look at you, they see a carnal man. A carnal person. When it comes to things of God, sit down. Sit down. Don't be too busy for nothing. Sit down and receive with meekness the implanted word. The Bible says it is able to save our souls. Praise the name of the Lord. Are you with me? This is what Paul says how to deal with the Malachites. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 verse number 5. Casting down imaginations and every I thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
We bring down everything that comes into our minds to deceive us, to, you know, to, 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 to divert us from the real truth of God's word, the real intake of the word. And when we can go ahead and think about this destruction, I call them flesh-feeding diversions, Amalekites. When you go all these things, and this is what somebody must go back, must pursue. God told David, pursue and recover everything. This is what in our effort to pursuing and recovering everything, they stand out as our stumbling blocks. Every person who is zealous and wants to be an obedient, faithful Christian, he finds this as destruction. Amen. Are you with me? When a person is defiled, they cannot recover all. When your mind is corrupted, you cannot recover all. And David has to recover everything because he's got to be king in Zion. Hallelujah. That's where he's headed to. Here is a challenge. God has told him, here's the word of God. Go ahead and recover everything. Put away the Amalekites. It's upon David to do every battle, every possible thing to ensure that he has fought all the battles. In fact, after this battle, the next station that David goes is in Hebron. The first place he's got to rule as king. Are we together? And therefore, this battle must be fought with vigor and vitality. It must be fought brilliantly. It must be fought by all means. Those imaginations must be cast down. They must be brought up. They must be brought into subjection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In this defiled, polluted pop culture, our minds are bombarded with sinful snares. We see it in books. We see it in billboards. We see it in TVs, advertisement, internet, music, in education. We are bombarded every day in the area of our minds. The very place those imaginations and those strongholds must be pulled down from. It's because of these diversions that we give to the flesh a room. kwamba, we cannot be able to recover all. And this indicates clearly that Christian believers... Their life and their walk with God is under constant assault. We are being fought on a daily basis. And if we don't care, if we don't mind of this, let me tell you, we will not be able to move on to rulership. David has been fighting this whole idea of ruling in Zion. But every time he attempts, they are they sore, and now there are Malachites. Here are battles here and there. All are aimed at stopping him from ascending the throne. And this is exactly what happens. Let me tell you, a victorious Christian life will necessitate continuous spiritual birth in the word of God. We get ourselves into the word of God, into prayer, into fellowship with God's people. And without this, you know, you can be assured you will fight a losing battle. Without fighting the flesh and bringing the flesh into subjection, then you will be brought down. Let me close by these words because we are only able to handle that point. We are not in a hurry in any way. In James 1.14, the Bible says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Verse number 15, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Every man is drawn into those fleshly affairs. Hakuna mtu yoyote. Ambawa mungu atamuingiza katika dhambi. Those who commit the sin of fornication, it doesn't begin. It doesn't just happen. Mtu alianza mahali. Huh? Labda pengine uliambiwa maneno ukakubali. Labda ya kwanza ukaambiwa maneno ukakataa. Ya pili ukaambiwa ingine, ulitekwa kama kuku kwa tupua mind moja, mbili, tatu, alafu baadaye ukamesa yote. Alafu baadaye ukajikuta. Mtu anasema nimejikuta. There is no such a thing as kujikuta. Mwambi jirani yako kuna kitu ya kujikuta. You track it. Track it. Eh? Yeah? Kabla ujajambu kati hiyo kitanda kulianza wapi? 
Maana umeanza kuniangalia hivi. Eh? Kabla uja ingizwa katika hiyo mpango, ulianzia wapi? Hapana maji ulipeleka innocently. Ukaambiwa thank you, thank you, thank you. Eh? Alafu kitu kakafuata, kafuata, kafuata and then finally hmm? or you are driven by the flesh and then that flesh started showing you that girl is more beautiful than your wife and slowly by slowly you even started spending your family money badala ya kupeana pesa ya kununua unga nyumbani unaenda napelekea mtu pale ka secretary kamekaa mahali pale nambia god bless you unapatia pesa ambayo huwezi kupatia bibi yako hmm? Unaenda pale na mstua anamwambia nataka kupeleka Nairobi. Na unjoe peleka bibi yako Nairobi. Saa hiyo chakula hakuna nyumbani. Huh? Slowly by slowly unajikuta katika hali ngumu. Everyone is tempted. James 1:14 is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Death means separation. And First Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Amalekites are enemies of the soul. In my final scripture, Paul says, those who are controlled by Amalekites or by the flesh, now these are the deeds of the flesh which are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, functions. Verse number 21, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and this, things like, of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you before, that those who practice such, this shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice those things, the Bible says, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I would like you to see, just as it were with David entering into the kingdom, it is the same thing with believers. Our, that which is stake is entering the kingdom. And that kingdom is the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if we are only guided and live by the flesh, we will not find a place in his kingdom. David has to fight to restore everything. And he's got to fight all the Amalekites. And they limited them totally so that he can be able to move on to Hebron where he begins to reign in the tribe of Judah. And Hebron is the third location where God teaches him ways on how to rule. But remember, for him to go to Hebron, he must deal with the Malachites. Tell your neighbor, he must deal with the Malachites. <laughs> Hallelujah. He cannot allow him to ascend the throne he can, if he cannot defeat the same enemy that Saul, his predecessor, was not able to fight. So God puts him into a difficult situation. Fight Amalekites. Defeat Amalekites that your predecessor is not able to fight. And if you are done with, uh, with the Amalekites, then you can ascend to the throne and begin ruling not in the kingdom uh, in full, but one tribe of Israel. Eventually, when you are able to get that establishment, then you will finally rule in Zion. This we can study forever. Let's stand up together. We are the word of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. After that destruction, after the battles, God brings to us a word of hope that we can go back and restore everything that we have lost. And here, standing before me, are people that have lost so much and they don't desire to go back again. They desire that the Lord restores them. They desire that the Lord repackages them. They desire that the Lord opens new doors for them. They desire that they will walk with God. I want to bring this to an end quickly to Toya Matoleo Yetu. Niko actually na chukua So we will use those two minutes so that we can be on time to give our offerings, to give our tithes. Let us demonstrate our obedience, our faithfulness, 
to that which God brings to us. Remember our giving is another battle of the flesh. Tuko pamoja mene. Bana atifuwe sana. Ni vita pari. Shetani ataki utowe. Kwa sababu, wanataka ufanya kama soul, you restore the fatlings and the good things. Lakini usifanya what is in obedience to God's word. When we bring our tithes, when we bring our offerings, we walk in faithful obedience. Music